Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. It's a nice large group. Uh, we feel certain that this will <clears throat> be a time well worth spent here, and we hope you leave inspired. Those of us who have been hearing Danielle all day long, are <laughs> it's going to be hard to get even more inspired, but I bet we will be. <laughs> I'm Ruth Schantz. I'm the current convener of Friends of Restorative Justice of Washtenaw County, which is one of the um, organizers of this day-long event. We're a group of citizens, um, local citizens, who are deeply persuaded by the research on the efficacy of restorative justice practices. And um, these are practices used in various uh, legal systems in places across this country, but also internationally. Friends of Restorative Justice of Washtenaw County was born in 2012 um, out of the experiences of Janet and Stan Reedy after their house was broken into by um, a local teenager. And although the Reedys felt that they were well um, taken care of by uh, our local court system, they left with a profound sense that something was missing from this whole uh, experience. And specifically, they wanted to have the opportunity to talk with the young man and also to work with him on restitution, work together. So they and others uh, of us from their church who were aware of the restorative practice of victim offender conferencing, began conversations with our local juvenile justice uh, office, as well as the Dispute Resolution Center, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Following Fred Van Loo's first visit to Ann Arbor, a number of other community members joined us and we formed Friends of Restorative Justice. And since then, we've been joined by the Healing Communities, which is <clears throat> a local group working on prisoner reentry issues. Today, we are associated with the Dispute Resolution Center, and many of us have been trained to be volunteer mediators and circle keepers. Our mission is to pursue a balanced and restorative approach to crime and to violence one that promotes justice, reparation, resolution to victims and to the community. So we welcome you to join us in our monthly meetings and uh, the brochure that you may have seen uh, coming in on restorative justice I think has our website on it. So we're very um, happy to always welcome new members. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Mary Lynn Stevens. I'm uh, 17 years worth of, of work at the U of M and retired from there uh, from here a year ago. Wonderful, awesome years. But um, today I'm here to represent CAPS, the other group that was one of the, the major leaders in getting uh, Danielle here today and making this quite a, a spectacular moment for all of you as well, I hope. So we're, thank you for coming. Um, there is an enormous list. When, when, the, when the biggest text block in a program is all the sponsors. It's a, a great problem to have. So we're not going to read them all, and but we will be referring to them. Please do take a time and, and get a sense of that. It's a, a wonderful uh, mix of sort of town and gown, if you will, as well. Uh, real uh, nonprofit organizations and the university and some others. So. Um, but anyway, CAPS, very briefly, if you don't know us, some of you do. Um, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, policy and advocacy shop, um, unfortunately located in Lansing, but not East Lansing. Um, and uh, CAPS actually stands for the Citizens Alliance on Prisons and Public Spending. Um, it's a, it's a, a mouthful, now you know why we go by the acronym CAPS, but it is a, our work is very straightforward and it's important. I want you just very briefly to know about it. Um, in the arena of criminal justice reform in Michigan, all about state law and state practice, we conduct extensive research we then use that research to come up with policy recommendations, what's really strong and solid and ought to happen. We then do advocacy to um, advance those policies. And if you want to know more, there is some literature in the back, and I'll be around, as will our director, Laura Sager, um, at the, uh, at the um, 
reception afterwards, so you can do that. So we do those three things, and we also do lots of education and outreach statewide so that everybody can learn about all this, and that's what brought us here today. Um, and we do all this work really in pursuit of really only two policy goals. They connect explicitly to Danielle, and they really are our mission. They're what we're about. We're about two things. One is ending Michigan's overuse of incarceration and promoting community safety and healing. That, that's it. And with that dual mission in mind, more commitment to safety and less reliance on incarceration, who could be better than Danielle uh, to be here? Um, somebody whose, whose work um, sort of screams and validates and celebrates the fact that those two things belong in the same breath. So really, really so glad to have her here. Already this morning, she headlined a forum um, in Lansing so that state officials could learn about all of this and really engage with the idea. And I'm very happy it's our turn now. So really, um, thanks to all of you for coming. It's really sort of on behalf of all the sponsors that, again, that big list that I hope you look at. Um, I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I know a lot of you do this work. I'm going to thank you for that. And, um, I'm going to turn this over to Carolyn, who's going to actually introduce it, and we're going to get to Danielle. Hi. My name is Carolyn Madden. I'm also from Friends of Restorative Justice of Washington County. It's wonderful to be here, and as you've heard, we are among the many community organizations and university departments that have brought, brought Danielle here to Ann Arbor. Uh, but before we hear her speak, I want to make just a few announcements. Uh, make sure that you understand the process. We will have, Danielle will speak, and then we will have time for questions, and you should have cards on your table, and so please write uh, some questions that you have, and we will have people come around sort of after the talk is halfway through, collect the questions, and then we have two wonderful representatives from the Gerald Ford School of Public Policy who will be asking questions of Danielle. We also have a reception in the lobby, which maybe some of you have partaken already, but please feel free to uh, have more as you leave and stay around in the uh, lobby out there for discussion. And in case you want a bit more of a formal discussion about next steps, please come back in. Uh, and we have a few people who are willing to sort of run a little bit of a discussion about next steps to take in Washington County. Uh, also, we have sign-up sheets, as uh, Ruth said. If you're interested in working with restorative justice, uh, please sign the sheet, and uh, we will be in touch with you. So, okay. Uh, again, thanks to all who made this possible. I uh, just want to mention our other organizing uh, sponsors were, uh, the, uh, besides the two of us, American Friends Service Committee, Michigan Criminal Justice Program, University of Michigan Gerald Ford School, how could we not thank them for this wonderful venue? And Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency, who besides all the wonderful work they did have supplied the food for us outside. So we're very grateful to them and all of the sponsors, truly. It's been a community effort to get this to happen. I also wanted to give a slight mention to Judy Levy. Uh, I don't know if she's here yet. Uh, she is a, a United States District Court judge from the Eastern District of Michigan, and she's a faculty member of the University of Michigan Law School. She inspired us to bring Daniel Sered here to speak on behalf of restorative justice. And second, I wanted to thank Kate McCracken, who's there taking pictures. She's the communications director of CAPS, and uh, who not only coordinated all of us in making all of these events run smoothly, but did it with thoughtfulness and respect every step of the way. And then third, I want to thank Ivy. Where is Ivy? Ivy is back there. She's a graduate student in public policy at Gerald Ford and applied economics in the economics department. She has waved her magic organizing wand to get this venue and the Ford School support for this event. So we're very grateful to everyone. Okay, now to our speaker. Speaker Daniel Sered has spent much of her life, by her own words, as a student of violence. She's worked within the justice system as an innovator, seeking alternatives to incarceration and to end violence and mass incarceration. She worked with youth in Adolescent Reentry Initiative for Returning Young Men on Rikers Island. 
and with the Center for Court Innovations Harlem Community Justice Center, a little mouthful there. <laughs> she was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and in 2012, she received an award for innovation in victim services from Attorney General Holder, remember him? <laughs> <laughs> and the Federal Office for Victims of Crime. Most recently, she was interviewed by The Atlantic, a wonderful interview, you could see it online, and has published an article by the same title as her talk today. She currently teaches restorative justice at City University of New York and is the executive director of Common Justice. It's an organization dedicated to helping victims of violent crime, rehabilitating violent felons, and developing alternatives to incarceration. Wow. So, with further ado, please join me and uh, applaud for Daniel Serrett. Hi. Thank you all so much for having me here and welcoming me in this space, and thanks to all that many um, long list of people who made it possible today. Um, I want to talk with you about violence, and so I would like to talk about um, why we have to take on the question of violence and how I think we should do that. Um, I will sort of start in the middle, which is to say that we cannot end mass incarceration unless we take on the question of violence. And there are two main reasons for that. The first is the, the deeper of the two, which is that our tolerance for incarceration in this country is built on a story about violence. It's a story about who commits it, about who survives it, about what each of them are and what they want. It's a story as old as our country and as wrong as the worst parts of our history. It's a story about an imagined monstrous other, someone who is somehow fundamentally different from us and the people we know and love, someone from whom we have to be protected, from whom we cannot protect ourselves, and whose inhumanity makes just about any action justifiable and reasonable to keep us protected from that harm. That story in this country is also a story of structural racism. It's the story we've told about people of color and have told in a particular way about black men in America. It's the story that makes it seem reasonable to build a prison instead of a school, to build jail beds instead of hospital beds, to invest in corrections officers instead of teachers or counselors or roads or any of the other things you wish were a little better in your day-to-day -day lives. And it's a story that we, on the side of people who typically advocate for criminal justice reform, almost invariably avoid. We, our opponents say they're all monsters. We say, well, st statistically speaking, about 40% of them aren't monsters, and another 15% with evidence-based practices could become 10% less monstrous with the right, you know, like we, <laughs> so we fight an ancient narrative with technocratic nonsense that reveals our unwillingness to say like, no, actually every single one of them is human. And some of them are humans who have done things that are horrific that none of us have any right to do, but they're fully human and we know them and they are ours. And so until we take on that story, we will continue to build prisons and we'll continue to do it instead of everything else we could do with those resources because that story is at the centerpiece of mass incarceration, no matter what number of people are incarcerated for other kinds of offenses. And we have to understand the fight to end mass incarceration at its centerpiece as a fight against that story. The second reason we have to take on the question of violence is a little more basic, and it's just that we won't reduce incarceration by more than half without doing so, because more than half of people locked up are in for crimes of violence. 
Now, like, I wouldn't stand a chance in a semester of an applied economics PhD course, but I know that to be true. So 53% of people in state prisons are incarcerated for violence. We are not getting to a transformative reduction in the system unless we take on those crimes. And I said this this morning, too, but even when I say 50%, and some people are like, wow, that's really ambitious. Let's be clear, the day I was born, there were 443,850 people locked up in the United States. I'll ask you not to calculate my age if you're really good at the sort of criminal justice math history. Um, 443,850, there are more than 2.3 million today. Which means even when I say 50%, that means conceding a threefold increase in just my lifetime. So a world where we incarcerate only 20% of the people who are currently locked up is not some wild, imagined, strange future. It's a place many of us were born into and lived through, and lived through often in a greater degree of safety and, and well-being than we may feel now. And so it's important that we not accept the stories that talk about us as though we are some pie in the sky fools when we talk about making possible something that has been possible and is possible everywhere else in this world and all other times in human history, right? Nowhere else in human history ever has incarcerated such a large portion of its people compared to what we do in this country. And so when we say that we can be different, what we are saying is that we can be like everyone else everywhere ever. Um, that's not a radical notion. Um, but the other thing is that we, not only can we not end mass incarceration if we don't end violence, but we can't end violence if we don't end mass incarceration. And we'll talk about this in a little more detail a little later when I talk some about safety. But we have to understand mass incarceration not just as something that fails to deliver on the promise of safety, which it does every day over and over, but as something that makes us less safe. So when we know that inequity drives violence and that incarceration drives inequity, it means incarceration puts us in danger. When we know that ripping funds from the social service infrastructure makes violence more likely and healing less available, it means incarceration drives violence. When prisons are demonstrated to be criminogenic, meaning people who go can be more likely to commit crimes than people who didn't get caught, Incarceration drives violence. And so even if we don't care about incarceration, if we care about ending violence, we have to lose it. We have to stop. And we won't be safe until we do. At Common Justice, we believe there are four main principles that should guide our approaches to violence. The first of those is that approaches to violence should be survivor-centered. It seems straightforward that the people whose lives are changed by what has been done should be at the center of our conversations and questions about what should be done about that pain. That their feelings should matter, their insights should matter, their needs should matter, their desires should matter. That doesn't mean we're solely driven by them. We live in community with each other, we've got a government, we have all sorts of other constraints on what happens. But it means we shouldn't get to summarily disregard what they want in the decisions about their cases and then about policy generally. We live in a country that pretends to regard that highly. We enact laws and victims' names. We do that quite literally. We have Marcy's Law and Sarah's Law and a lot of other white women's names laws. And we say that we're doing it on behalf of victims. Um, we do that without asking most victims what they want. When we do ask, we often disregard what they tell us they want because it runs contrary to what we expected to hear or what is useful to the policy we are trying to advance. We set a policy goal and then find victims who like it instead of talking to the full range of survivors and letting their experience guide us in what policy goals we select and identify. And we lie about who victims are, about what they want, about what heals them, and what brings them peace. And perhaps worst of all, we lie to victims about that. So we have a national picture of crime victims that they look like me. Um, I am a survivor of serious violence, so to some degree that's right. But a young man of color is 10 and a half times more likely than me to be robbed or assaulted and is virtually nowhere in our national story about who is hurt. That's because in part telling that story would make that original story a little confusing, right? 
It would be complicated if the imagined monstrous other and the person at greatest risk of victimization were the same person. And it would maybe implicate us in that perceived monstrosity because it would ask us where were we when he was hurt. So we don't like for those stories. They don't coexist comfortably. And it's part of why telling that second story is so important about being honest about who is hurt. But then the next thing we have to do is be honest about what people want when they're hurt. And across ages, across demographics, across race, people who are want hurt tend to want a few things. They want answers. They want to know why you chose them. Was it a real gun? Were you going to shoot? How dare you think you have the right? They want, to know, they want closure, right? So they want a story they can live with. And the world of trauma healing, we talk about it as a coherent narrative, but it's a story about what happened that describes a world you can choose to continue to live in. They want some sense of control relative to the event. The fundamental trauma basically distills down into powerlessness, right? The basic element of trauma is powerlessness, which means its opposite is power. And so victims want some power. They want to have a say in what will happen about what happened to them. And most of all, at the end of the day, they want to know that they and others will not go through that again, that that person won't hurt them again, that others won't hurt them in the same way, and that that person won't hurt others in the way that they were hurt. Most of that for victims doesn't mean incarceration. So what we know at Common Justice, I run, at the centerpiece of our work is an alternative to incarceration for serious and violent felonies, um, where if and only if the victims of crime consent, People who've committed crimes like assaults and robberies, so shootings, gunpoint robberies, stabbings with serious injuries, enter into a restorative justice process where after extensive preparation, they enter into dialogue with the people they hurt, reach agreements about how to make things as right as possible, and if they fulfill those agreements, have the felony charges against them dismissed and don't go to prison. In the meantime, we provide wraparound services to the victims of their crimes to help them come through what happened to them and in their lives generally. When I say that we only do this with victims' consent, it's important to talk about what that means. So first of all, fewer than half of victims of violence in America call the police in the first place. That's a stunning number. It means half of people who are rendered unconscious, who have to be hospitalized, who suffer serious injury, who have lasting physical and psychological impacts prefer nothing to everything we have on offer in our criminal justice system. So if the system were as victim-centered as it purports to be, and as a lot of people's bumper stickers and other kind of hostile remarks suggest it is, we would understand that as a central moral crisis of our culture, and we would be obsessed with correcting that wrong. We couldn't be farther from it. Of those half who call the police, fewer than half of those make it to grand jury. Sometimes that's because there's not an arrest. Sometimes there's not an arrest because the police don't try particularly hard if you're a particular kind of victim. Sometimes there is an arrest, but the victim decides not to come. They called in a moment of crisis, and then they divest from the process that follows because they don't believe it will give them what they need. So of that small portion of people who make it to grand jury, we reach out to the smaller portion of those who've survived violence. And we ask them, do you want the person who hurt you to be incarcerated, or do you want them in common justice? When we give them that choice, 90% choose common justice. 90%. It's a crazy number. right? If I was like, one thing I want everyone to know about common justice, it's that number. And I, at first, I thought that was because we are genuinely good people. Like, we're <laughs> compassionate, and we care, and we believe in transformation, and we know we've made mistakes, and so do others, and we believe people change, and we say, but for the grace of God, go I, and I think that is sometimes true. But the thing that we are more than I gave us credit for is that we are practical. And I should have known that about crime survivors as a survivor myself. Crime survivors have a reputation for being very emotional, and we have very strong feelings. Those feelings, it turns out, do not override or exclude our ability to exercise reason. Um, I said this morning, I think it's largely probably sexism that makes us think those two qualities are incompatible with each other, like feeling a feeling and making a choice at the same time. It turns out we can do both. Um, all of us. It means men can start feeling feelings, women can be trusted to make choices. <laughs> Wherever we are, like there's a lot, there's good news in it for everyone. Um, and 
and when I say we're practical, I mean like we, of course, we feel the things that we feel when we're hurt. We feel rage that like shakes us to our core, like makes us almost unrecognizable to ourselves. Like we feel loss that makes us want to like wring out the marrow of our bones to be rid of it, right? We feel terror in the safest places with the people we know and trust most, like abject terror, shaking terror, like unresolvable terror. Like we feel confused, we feel furious, we feel angry, we feel betrayed, we feel all sorts of things that we are entitled to feel. And yet when we are asked what we want, almost every time we will choose the thing that will make us and others safer. That the one thing that outranks all of that emotion is our pragmatism. And that pragmatism is rooted in our self-interest and in our care for the people around us. And so our emotions sometimes get co-opted and get put to the service of draconian sentencing that does not make us safe, that does not heal us, that does not meet our needs, that does not answer our questions, that does not give us all the things we deserve. But when we are asked and given options, we will choose the option that will keep us and others safe almost every time. And if we are among the vast majority of crime survivors who live in neighborhoods where violence is prevalent, and which are the same neighborhoods where incarceration is present, you will have a very hard time persuading us that incarceration will keep us safe. That's not because we're liberal. It's not because we're abolitionists. It's not because we're radical. It's because we observe what we see in our own homes, in our buildings, on our blocks, in our neighborhoods every day. And we see that for the most part, prison makes people worse. And there are people with the strength of spirit to withstand the onslaught of what happens in prison and so not to be made worse by it. There are people who even become better in prison, but they do that not because of prison, but despite it. But most people who live in neighborhoods where incarceration has promised safety live day to day with the degree to which that promise is unfulfilled. And so when given an option for something that might do better, people choose that option, not for innovation and not even usually for compassion, but for pragmatism and safety. The second thing that we believe should guide our responses to violence is that we think they should be accountability-based. It's important to distinguish accountability from punishment. Punishment is passive. You don't have to do anything to be punished. Someone else has to do something, but you don't. You have to just not escape it. Accountability is different. Accountability requires that you acknowledge what you've done, acknowledge the impact of those actions, express genuine remorse, make things as right as you possibly can, and do the extraordinarily hard labor of becoming someone who won't do those things ever again. Accountability is some of the hardest work we as people will ever do. When we do it, it is transformative to the people to whom we are accountable. But maybe even more importantly, it is transformative to us. And so I'd ask you to take a moment and think about a time that you did something that you know is wrong. And you can decide whether you want to think of a little thing or a big thing, like check in on how you're doing today. Don't go too big just because I asked you to. I know I'm at the very official lecture, so I can tell you what to do, but don't do something that's not good for you. Um, a time that you did something you knew was wrong that you made as right as you could. And so think about what the thing was and how you made it as right as possible. And take a moment to just pay attention to how it feels to think about that. And now take a moment to think about a thing you did that you know was wrong, that you didn't make right. Because you didn't know how, because it was too late, because you didn't have access to the person, because by the time you figured it out, you couldn't figure your way through because you still don't quite see the way. And sit for a moment with how that feels. I would venture that the latter is harder. Um, the first, I think, probably most of us can think of and still feel a good amount of self-love, a good amount of pride in who we are. We can recognize ourselves in it. We could tell someone, just about anyone about it, and still feel like we'd be able to be deserving and worthy of their respect. 
That second one, a little harder. The best word I know for that feeling, it's not a perfect word, but it's the best I know, and that's shame. And shame is probably my least favorite emotion, like if we're going to rank them. Um, there's a bunch of crappy ones. It's my least favorite. Um, shame is known to be a core driver of violence, which means feeling ashamed of what we have done put us at risk, puts us at risk of hurting people, ourselves and others. Um, and it's hard to know the pathway out of shame. And so when we talk about grief and loss, we know we talk about a pathway. We talk about stages of grief. We talk about the things you go through in a process that we all sort of know and recognize and understand and can talk about that return us to our self-love, to our hope, to our connection with each other, to our dignity. I believe accountability is the corollary to grief for when we do something wrong. And that in answering for what we have done, we return to our self-love, to our hope, to our connection, to our dignity. It's part of why that first example feels different. It's part of why like, the ancient Hebrew word teshuva, which is sometimes talked about as repentance, is also means return. Right? It's, that, it's a return to a place of a particular kind of wholeness. And so I believe that holding people accountable is an act of love. I am certain people in common justice wish we loved them less because um, it's undoubtedly incredibly hard. And so when we deny the accountability of people who have committed harm, we aren't helping them. When we excuse their actions, when we talk about the, the idea that like, the horrific thing they did was inevitable because of their terrible childhoods or terrible neighborhoods or terrible families or terrible lives, that doesn't mean that we should not acknowledge the way pain generates more pain, the way unhealed trauma is one of the surest drivers of future violence, the way our indifference to certain people's pain sets us up for a society of violence. But it does mean we shouldn't make excuses. We shouldn't do it because it's wrong for the people who were hurt. They did not hurt less because of any feature in the person who hurt them. Their pain is just as real. It's unstrategic politically. Excuse making goes over really poorly in a political context when we're seen as apologizing for the worst things people do. But it's also wrong for the people who commit that harm because it excuses them from an accountability process that is precisely the road out of shame and back to dignity. It creates a barrier between them and that transformation. And that transformation is one of the most important things any of us can ever have the gift of undergoing in our lives. And so we believe responses to violence should be accountability-based. And the good news is that when people are accountable, when we face what we have done, we are very likely to be transformed by it, partly because of how hard that is and how much we don't want to do it again, and partly because in it we are reconnected to the people with whom we share community. The third principle we think should drive our responses to violence is that they should be safety-driven. That also sounds obvious. And yet at the same time, nothing of what we do has basically anything to do with generating safety. And so, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, and so our current approach to violence bears no relationship to everything we know about what causes and what ends violence. That seems weird. Like our approaches to disease are always rooted in what we know about what causes and what ends disease. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. And yet in the criminal justice arena, our approaches to violence are driven by rhetoric. They're dri driven by sort of outdated philosophical notions. They're driven by myth. Um, and they're driven by vengeance. It's my belief they should be driven by safety, that when the government intervenes in a situation where someone is unsafe, their intervention should make us all safer, that that's what they're there for. It's part of why we so joyfully pay our taxes. And what we know is that the core drivers of violence for individuals, so the biggest drivers of violence are structural. They're poverty. They're inequity. They are racial inequity. They're unhealed trauma. They're all these things, these structural factors. They're things like redlining drives violence. On the individual level, the core drivers of violence are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, 
and an inability to meet one's economic needs. I would argue the four core features of prison are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. So it means our core response to violence has as its very central dimensions precisely the things that generate violence. That is not what people who want to end violence do. To expect the criminal justice system as we know it to produce safety is wholly irrational. It's like it putting out a fire by throwing a Molotov cocktail through the front door of a building. It doesn't make sense that it would quell the flames. What we know about what ends violence are things like relationship, accountability, healing, access to supports, right? All these other things. We know what ends violence. Because a ton of those cases that don't make it to the criminal justice system, a lot of those actually result. Some of them end terribly. Some of them go on to result in more harm. And some of them end in some measure of healing and some measure of reconciliation and some measure of peace. Because when we, go, when we take into our own hands the resolution of violence, once in a while we get it right. Not always, but probably as often as our criminal justice system does. And so what we have now in our response to violence has in it none of the core ingredients of safety. And so if it does not have the core ingredients, it will not produce it. And what we know at Common Justice is that there are other pathways. And so in the work we do, fewer than 7% of our participants have been terminated for new crimes on our watch. Of the people who started since January 2012, after our first couple years of learning, one has been terminated since January 2012 in nearly six years. Find me a prison that can say that. Um, not to be sassy. Um, a little sassy. I like saying that to people who run correction systems. It's my favorite. Um, they secretly like it too. Um, they just don't show it. Um, we know how to produce safety, and it's things that make sense. It's facing what you've done. It's making those things right. It's developing the economic means to meet your needs other than through violence. It's addressing the underlying pain that drives what you did in the first place. It's being answerable. It's being connected. Um, it's being in community with people who you make a commitment to never hurting again and to doing the work of becoming someone who won't. And so we can produce safety if we choose to. We cannot produce it through prisons. And our ability to produce it in other ways will be dramatically undercut by the scale of our prison system in this country. Because the division of families reduces safety. Because the investment in prisons at the expense of everything else reduces safety because the exit and return of people, the inconsistency of community and the constant disruption reduces safety, and because the violence and trauma people undergo while in prison also reduce safety. And so we have a threat to our safety in this country, and it is a growing threat. It is one that has grown dramatically over the last 30 years, and it is our system of mass incarceration. And unless we make it our business to eradicate that threat, we will not be safe with each other. The last principle that we think should guide our responses to violence is that we believe that they should be racially equitable. We believe that first for practical reasons, which is that inequity is demonstrated to be a driver of violence. So if you know something produces a thing and you want less of the thing, you have to do less of the thing that produces the thing. Um, and, and we don't do that. So on the one hand, we know we have to eliminate inequity as a risk factor for our culture. But when I talk about racial inequity, I'm not talking only about defendants in the system. So it's important to know that there are racial disparities at every single stage of the criminal justice system, at any point where a human can make a decision or where a risk assessment instrument developed in part by humans is used, that inequities persist. So that is at arrest, it's at arraignment and bail, it is at the felony arraignment, it is at charging, it is at plea offers, it is at sentencing, it is at parole. And at each of those places, the inequities that happened in the previous place are only exacerbated almost every time. It's why we understand mass incarceration to be the grandchild of slavery and the child of Jim Crow. It's we, why we understand it to be for me, the core civil rights question of our day, 
It's why I believe our children's children will ask us what we did about it, and we will be faced with ourselves when we answer that question, and that at our current moment, the answer is not one that will dignify us or will teach a lesson to that generation that we want to teach. Um, and it is all of ours to account for and to fix. But the inequity doesn't stop with the people who commit harm. It also includes people who are hurt. So we devalue certain crime victims. We particularly devalue victims of color. We pretend young men of color who were hurt had it coming to them, and that young women of color probably don't feel pain quite the same way as white women do because they're so strong. Right? So we tell stories that suggest that men of color deserve pain, that women of color can't feel pain. These are also old stories. And when we do that, we shouldn't be surprised by the portion of victims who don't call a criminal justice system that treats their pain as their fault or unimportant. And we are not a country that fulfills its promise to equity or to safety or its basic obligations to its citizens to treat them with dignity and equal regard. And we know we can do it differently, and we know that partly because of how we treat white people. I say this as a white person, so I know a lot about being a white person. Um, when I was charged with a bunch of crimes when I was a teenager, I was met with mercy. The judge saw in me a child who had made a mistake. The judge worried about me thought something must be happening, that I made these choices. The judge thought I could be something different than those choices, that I probably was already more than those choices, but certainly could become more than them if I wasn't yet. And the judge made a decision to give me my life back. I've described it as an off-ramp from my idiocy, right? Like adolescence is like nothing but idiocy. And as white folks, we get like off-ramp after off-ramp, like we get to grow up. We get to become people who got to grow up. That's what we are. We're people who got to grow up. Um, my co-defendant, who's a young man of color, was not met with that same mercy by any stretch. And it was revelatory to me. And it's partly because I think that the central, the first promise of privilege, the first gift of privilege, um, is that we don't have to experience it as such. The gift of privilege is we experience it as merit. We're hardworking. We're smart. We're articulate. We're kind. We're lucky, even. But surely we're not the beneficiaries of structures that give us things at the expense of others, that take things from people so that we can have them, that hurt people so we can feel safe, that destroy families so that our family can have just a little bit more. It would be hard to know we were that, right? And so I had the gift of having that myth ripped from me. And so I had to understand my privilege not as merit, but as privilege. And when that happens, you understand that that inequity is a threat to your very soul. And you make that inequity your enemy. And you spend your life finding the people to join with, to listen to, and to follow, so that by the end of your days here, you will have put up the best possible fight and maybe even taking it down. But the other thing that happens when someone does something for you that they don't do for someone else is that it reveals that that system can do what it wants. So prosecutors in America can end mass incarceration tomorrow by exercising discretion differently. Judges in the juvenile system could end juvenile incarceration tomorrow by exercising their discretion differently. No one has to pass a thing in a state legislature, which I'm sure is a great relief to people who try and pass things in state legislatures, um, for that to be possible, right? Because we can choose it differently. And so I think part of what our job is as white folks is to be people who testify to that fact that we have been diverted so many times I did a, a, what I will call an experiment with some of the children in my extended family, which is a like chosen family, mixed race. This is not like a statistically significant study. We grew up under the Vera Institute. This does not meet their standards. Um, I do not blame them for the inadequacy of this study. Um, 
and I asked the kids in my life what the word detention means. The white kids in my life, 201, said it was like when you were bad at school and had to stay after. Kids of color in my life, 201, said it's where kids go to jail. We know this is happening. No one's surprised. And so shame on us for knowing. And as white folks, the thing we know that cannot be denied to us is that something else is possible because it's done for us all the time. I talk about whiteness as the oldest alternative to incarceration in America. It produces great results in terms of like income, longevity, health outcomes, all sorts of things, alternatives to incarceration work. We're diverted all the time. We're asked what happened instead of what's wrong with you. We're asked what you need instead of what have you done. Like we're asked what can we do to help instead of how dare you, right? Like we are met with that. And that doesn't mean we're always met with mercy. We're met with rage. We're met with pain. We're hurt in our own families, in our own relationships, in the streets. Like we're not, it's not that we are not also exposed to pain. We unquestionably are. And yet, we are also met with mercy. We're met with discretion. And that's because we're met as though we're people who are more than the worst thing we've ever done. We are people who are capable of change. We are people where the exclusion of us from a community would be a loss, where the removal of us from our families would do damage. Those things are assumed to be true about us. And so part of what we can do is that when systems say they have no way to do a thing, we can mine our own experience for evidence that they can do that thing, and we can call BS on it. And we can insist that the things that are done for us are done for everyone. And we can refuse to accept the things that are done for us until they are also done for everyone. And so when we think about the work of ending mass incarceration, it's vast. It has to do with thinking about electoral politics. It has to do with legislatures and ballot measures and alternatives to incarceration and how different parts of the system exercise their discretion and what drives those choices and how we change those drivers. Um, but it also has to do with that very fundamental work that I started with, which is the work of being at war with the foundational myth of this country, with telling true stories in its place, with resisting those old stories whenever and wherever they are told, and with sitting with the worst things we have done individually and together and believing that if we are accountable for those things, if we acknowledge what we have done, acknowledge the impact of those actions, express genuine remorse, make things as right as possible, and become people who won't do those things again, that we as a country can also lift up out of that shame, back into a place of shared dignity, of shared connection, and of shared hope. And so it's my belief that as we join together in the struggle to end mass incarceration, that we are doing the work of accountability, which I've already told you I think is an act of love, and I have no question whatsoever, in part based on the results we see in our work, that if we do that together, we'll succeed. So thank you very much for your time today. and thank Danielle again for giving such a Thanks. wonderful presentation. Um, we're going to move into the questions and answer oh. section of our talk. You have note cards in front of you. If you have any questions, please write them down and we will be walking around collecting them. And um, we will have questions fielded by two students from the Ford School of Public Policy who I will have introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Abby Oreck. I'm a first year MPP interested mm -hmm. in urban education policy, particularly school culture and socio-emotional curriculums in middle and high schools. Cool. Hi, I'm Andrea Matei. Um, I'm also a first year MPP student at the Ford School, and I'm actually interested in criminal justice policy, so this is 
directly for me. <laughs> um, I can do the first question. Um, I have a question here that says, please describe training for staff in the process, in the process of crime and justice in detail. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm like, that's either a teacher or it's a student who's like, this is how they ask me questions. It's my turn. Um, so we do a lot of our training of our staff um, in the job and with us. There sort of aren't training programs that fully prepare people for what we do. Um, we don't look for people who have particular degrees. We have great regard for what a lot of people learn in school, and we don't believe that those lessons are only learnable in school settings. And so some of our staff have degrees in social work and counseling and those things, and some of our staff do not. Um, our staff universally come to us with a really sharp racial justice analysis. We don't hire people who don't already begin with that. Um, but for people who do, people go through intensive training in how we think about violence and what undoes it. Our curriculum is really methodical, so it's not sort of based in the charisma and engagement of our staff. Like the curriculum is entire inqu entirely inquiry based, meaning it's all questions um, for 15 months. Um, we believe that people know the things they need to know to become the people they should become. And so that the best way to bring that about is by asking them questions that help them sort of surface that in themselves. So our staff are also trained really deeply in the process of asking questions instead of telling people things that you wish they knew, which is harder than it seems. Um, and of course, we train people in the facilitation of circles. We also do a large body of national work that is mostly concentrated in a project called Healing Works, which is a national learning collaborative for people working with young men of color harmed by crime. Um, it's a learning collaborative. We are learning in it too, not just teaching. And we bring together people around the country who are doing the work of tending to the pain and violence young men of color in their communities experience and talking about the kinds of strategies that work to help people transform it. So we are also very continually um, a learning organization as best we can be. I hope that was adequately in detail. <laughs> Thank you. So I will give the next question. What do you see as the role of restorative practices in interrupting cycles of violence when they are implemented in schools? Mm -hmm. Totally. So we, I mean, the, we talk about the school to prison pipeline a lot, right? And the way we prepare people in their educational settings um, for a future of incarceration. There's the sort of classic example given that the way states estimate the number of jail beds they'll need a decade out is by looking at third grade reading scores, um, that it is the most reliable predictor more than any economic measure and certainly any crime measure. Um, so we know the relationship between what's happening in schools and what's, ha and what's happening in the criminal justice system is profound. We also know that Schools, particularly in urban settings, are becoming increasingly policed and policed in ways that mirror the very worst kinds of policing um, that happen in our streets and in our communities. And so the introduction of restorative practices in schools is super helpful developmentally, right? It helps young people develop the skills of addressing and transforming conflict. It helps them do that themselves to have those skills to bring to bear in their communities and their neighborhoods and conflicts that will never involve the police because no one will call them. But it also creates um, a real defense against the continued incursion of law enforcement into educational settings, which without exception happens in ways that are profoundly racially disparate um, and profoundly damaging to children. And the restorative justice for Oakland youth, let me just say their name and Fanya Davis's name if you're interested in these things. I think they are hands down the best people. Their practices have been systematically integrated into the unified school system in Oakland and California. They started their work in like the last step school, like where kids were suspended too, but the state still had some obligation to educate them. Um, that's school had the highest expulsion rates and the highest rates of violence anywhere in the district and within the few within a few years had one of the single highest graduation rates in the district and the single lowest suspension rates um, so they just they work like the practices work and there are people who know how to do them um, and those people are like extraordinary teachers who are lucky for all of us willing to teach 
restorative justice for Oakland youth, Fania Davis, who I am very lucky to consider a teacher of mine. Um, so, um, along with this restorative justice, um, how does it apply to cases of sexual violence, mm -hmm. rape, um, and coercion? So common justice doesn't address um, sexual violence. We don't do that because we think, sex it's not because we think sexual violence is worse, it's because we think sexual violence is different. I think one of the mistakes we make in the way we address violence is this, in this country is we treat all forms of violence like they're the same like a domestic violence homicide in Tulsa and a shooting in an open air drug market in Baltimore are fundamentally the same thing and therefore require the same response. It's a mistake, it's wrong, and it generates bad outcomes for everyone. And so when I say that we don't apply restorative practices to sexual violence, I don't mean that they can't be applied. I just mean that we don't. In places where people have begun to do that, people have seen some really powerful results. I think without a question, these processes require adequate preparation of all the parties. So everyone has to understand what it is, have accurate expectations of what will come out of it, have support going into it, and have the option to stop partway through. And similarly, we would never put someone in a circle who cannot take full responsibility for what they've done. And so until someone who has committed sexual harm can do the work of acknowledging that they had no right to do it, I wouldn't consider a circle in those cases. For people who can acknowledge that, that they had no right to do what they did and own it, I do believe it's possible to do. Thank you. Can you speak about the role of capitalism in mass incarceration and how that either, <laughs> and how that either inhibits um, restorative justice and how you think that we could overcome That's that. awesome. It's really fun to get these questions and not know who's asking them. Um, <laughs> it's like really funny. And people just like go for it too. I'm like whoever said in detail might not have said that if they had to stand up. Um, so yes. Um, so the most proximate relationship is things like private prisons are the obvious thing. Um, though those are by no means the only way people profit off of incarceration. I think the biggest growth we will see in private prisons is related to immigrant detention now, and so we have to understand the place of, um, we have to understand the detention of immigrants in our country as a dimension of mass incarceration um, and have to include it in our overall efforts to end it. Um, prisons are profitable in all sorts of other ways too, like the connection fee for most calls from prisons can be in as much as $15 for a single call, and it's not like you can go to another carrier because those are the only phones that you can use. The towns that depend on prisons for their income depend often very fully on them. So when people in those towns fight to keep those prisons open, they are not fighting for mass incarceration. That's not the animating factor. They are fighting for jobs. They are fighting for income. They are fighting to be able to put a roof over their children's heads. I've talked to a lot of corrections officers. I have met very few who believe prisons are great. It's hard to spend that much time in a prison and think it's a great idea. I have met many corrections officers, including ones who work in private prisons, where sometimes they are literally locked in for the course of the day, um, the people who work there, who are whose job is bondage, right? They are employed in the bondage business. And some of them, if you put another option on the table where they could make a real living, would crawl across broken glass to reach that option. And so those things are true at the same time. The thing I will say, too, though, is that this relationship is very old. So when you look at prisons now, we look at their predecessor in what was called convict leasing, right, which is like the leasing of humans, which is a very clear one step removed from the ownership of humans or the presumed ownership of humans. Um, and so we have for a long time um, had the, the sort of filthy alchemy of this country is the transformation of freedom into money, right? That's been our filthy alchemy from the start. And so I think it's 80% of the value of the stock market when it first began was derived from cotton. Right, so when we think about something like 
reparations, forget 40 acres and a mule. Like we're talking billions, right? And so I think we have to understand, um, we have to understand that as a country, the thing we have decided to turn into money is freedom. Um, and we have to decide if we want to continue to do that or not and separately decide you know, what we feel about capitalism overall, whether it's our thing or not. Uh, so we talked about this in the meet and greet earlier, mm -hmm. but um, just to the larger audience, uh, when you formed Common Justice, you have like a lot of interactions with prosecutors and DAs. Um, how hard was it to get them involved? Um, there's so many politics behind being tough on crime and, and getting elected mm -hmm. on that platform. So was it difficult um, mm -hmm. getting them on board in the first place? It's good we did this in the meet and greet because that'll help me not give a 40 minute answer here. Um, I like being asked about prosecutors. So the narrow answer to your question is that it wasn't terribly hard in part because I, um, I started Common Justice out of the Vera Institute of Justice and Vera leveraged their nearly 50 year reputation on my little idea. Um, and leverage their relationship with the district attorney at the time to get us into the room and get real consideration for that possibility. That helped immensely for it. But the reason the district attorney said yes was not just because like a really, really smart group of researchers asked him to. Um, it's because in Brooklyn we have developed a constituency that expects of their prosecutor to be forward thinking on criminal justice. Like you lose in Brooklyn for doing regressive things that ruin people's lives and you win in Brooklyn for being innovative. And I think one of the things when we think about prosecutors, we have to remember they are elected. We have to treat them like elected officials. We have to take their jobs from them when we don't like how they do them. Um, we have to remind them who they're accountable to. We have to do base building works in the communities most impacted by violence and incarceration so that the people who put them in office and can take them out are the same people whose lives are at stake in the decisions they make day in and day out, which is to say we have to actually be a representative democracy. Um, and when we do that, we can start to get prosecutors who rather than measuring their success by how many convictions they secure, begin to measure it by the degree to which they produce safety and fairness. And we have to hold them to account for that. That also means that when they take a risk and put someone in a program and that person commits a new crime, we have to stand with them. We have to say we asked them to do this and we're asking them to keep doing this because despite this one failure, overall this choice is a far smarter, far more sensible and far safer choice than incarceration. And when they incarcerate people who should not have been incarcerated and those people go on to commit more harm, we have to ask them why, when in the face of all sorts of evidence that incarceration was criminogenic and likely to produce a bad outcome, they went ahead and incarcerated per that person and say to them that your choice to incarcerate that person and the result of that, which is more violence, like that that blood is on your hands. And so we have to invert the things that they get off the hook for and the things they're held accountable to so that we hold them to the standards that we hold most dear. And if we do that, they're politicians, and so they'll do what we say. But they are not, for the most part, we sh I should be clear, for all my beef with prosecutors, which is a lot of beef, um, they aren't most of the time doing things other than what we ask them to do. They're doing what we say. They're doing what they think will get them reelected. And until we convey different expectations, it's unreasonable to expect them to behave any differently. So. I'll stop. It's hard for me to stop talking about prosecutors. Next question. So, so this next one is a really wonderful kind of philosophical question. Cool. Um, what do you think are some of the factors responsible for the desire for vengeance? Mm -hmm. How can society and politics devalue the need for vengeance mm -hmm. and correct the confusion of justice for vengeance? Yeah. Um, this, is really, this is a strangely funny format. Um, I think partly because when people ask questions in real life, they sort of build on the one before in a way that's a little less funny. So this is a fun exercise. Um, so the desire for vengeance, like the feeling, um, the feeling of satisfaction and the notion of someone else who hurt us suffering is real. It's almost never permanent. 
It's almost never satisfying when we actually get it. It never heals us. It never relieves our trauma. Like it is not, like vengeance is not the opposite of trauma. Um, so it doesn't work, but it's, it can be very appealing. Um, for most of us, it's a temporary part. It's one of the thousand things we feel as we move through the course of a healing trajectory, which is never linear. So we might feel it one time and feel it again later, and it'll arise and pass. I believe that actually pretty fundamentally that um, the desire for vengeance isn't actually quite that. I think the desire for vengeance is at its most fundamental a desire for recognition. It's a desire to have our pain seen and known. And that is about, as human beings, our need to be seen and known. It is about the way violence against us feels like an erasure, feels like a threat to our very existence. Um, and it, the counterbalance to that is to insist on our existence, to insist on being seen and known and felt. And so I think very often we need that recognition. And the one thing we can think of that would do that is revenge. Like the one thing where we would know that we are seen, that we are know that it is felt, is for that other person to see and feel it. It's part of why the most important thing we say to victims at Common Justice when we reach out to them to ask them about whether they want the program or not is that we say what happened to you is wrong. We acknowledge it. We ask what happened. We ask how it felt. We say it was wrong. And almost every time after we say that, people are like, all right, let's do the program. Right? We need to be seen in what's been done to us. And so I think while I do believe the human need for recognition is fundamental to our being, I believe that the desire for vengeance is largely a sort of cultural phenomenon mapped on to that fundamental human need and desire, the way a lot of these things are. Um, I think when individual people who are hurt um, or people whose communities have been hurt now and historically want vengeance, that that is appropriate to want, that makes a lot of sense. When systems seek vengeance, I think it's totally inappropriate. It's an irrational emotion, right? Our systems are not supposed, they don't have feelings. Like, they're not supposed to get to do feely things. They're supposed to make sense. They're supposed to be bound by reason. They're supposed to be bound by fairness and justice. They're supposed to be bound by what works. And so systems shouldn't get to act out of a fleeting and often changing emotion. Because part of the problem, too, is that unlike human beings, systems don't change very fast. So when you bake one emotion into it, unlike for a person who, when they are well loved or when they are seen or where they get to stand by the ocean for a minute or where they finally get one night of real sleep since they were hurt, that that feeling starts to recede. Once you build that feeling into a system, the system doesn't have a mechanism to get it out because it's not alive, like it's not a person. It doesn't know how to just feel a new thing. That's not what it is. And so when we build whole structures around particular emotions, it means that they have, they become rigid and ossified around those emotions because they don't have kind of the involving nimbleness that we as humans do. Um, and at the same time, when I say this, I want to be really clear that wanting revenge when you've been hurt is just, it's con there's nothing wrong with it. There may be something wrong with taking revenge. There is definitely something wrong with assuming everyone else wants what you want. But like you get to want revenge, just like you get to want to die. Right, like you get to want the things that happen when we've been hurt, and we're not wrong for wanting them, but what we deserve are processes that let us move from those places into places where we feel things that like make us wanna live and that make us wanna live right. Um, and so I think it's really important that we don't judge people who have been hurt for the, as though they're somehow worse than v victims who can forgive right away. Like, it's not about, there's not, it's not a hierarchy in that. It's about which of the thousand things we feel in our pain we want to build into our structures for responding to pain. And that's a decision we make collectively, and it's a decision we make wisely together. So I'm 
I'm going to interrupt here real quick and see if we have time for one more question. Again, thank you to the audience for all the wonderful questions that you have asked. And thank you to yes. Danielle for answering those questions so thank well. Thank you. These are cool. All Ready. right, so a lot of pressure picking the last one. Um, <laughs> uh, but I guess I'll go with this one. Uh, the question is, how do you get people who are indifferent about restorative justice slash mass incarceration issues to care about that? Hmm. Hmm. Easy last one. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks. Um, do you mean how do I <laughs> or how does one? <laughs> Can we clarify? Um, so I think... Um, we are, there are a couple ways we connect into these issues, right? Like one, we connect through our own experience surviving harm or loving people who have survived harm. And we're often taught that our experiences somehow don't count because we didn't call the police, because it wasn't as bad as what happened to our neighbor, because we were intoxicated at the time or wearing a short skirt, or because we were people of color, or because we had a history of committing a crime, or for a thousand reasons, or because we think that maybe we had it coming, that we did something to contribute to it, that even if we didn't in that case, we did something bad in another case, and we sort of believe in the idea that things come back around, right? So we do all sorts of things to devalue our own experience as being relevant to this conversation. And I think we have to stop doing that. I think we have to care about what's happened to us. What's cared, we have to care about what's happened to the people we love. And we have to understand that the criminal justice system is powered by stories about us. Um, like if I asked everyone in this room, if you or someone you love, not someone you've met or saw on TV, someone you love, has been impacted by violence, raise your hand. Like, it's all of us. It's not like victims, right? It's all of us. And so we have to understand that these are our issues and the degree to which we've been persuaded that they're separate from us is because of a set of stories um, that whether they're intentionally or unintentionally designed to do that have the effect of excluding the vast majority of our shared experience from the policy debates about what should be done about it. And then the other part is knowing that this is being done in our name. Like if I said to you there's someone out there like eating babies and he's doing it for you, like you would be like who? And you would call him and be like stop. Like that's not what I want you to do. Like I never said to do that. That's not okay. Not in my name. And so we also have to be honest that the things that are done in our name are ours. Like they belong to us. Um, and we have to own them, and we have to care about them, and we have to stop people from doing stuff about us without our permission or consent. And I think most of us don't like being talked about behind our backs, and most of us don't like being used, uh, and most of us don't like being manipulated, and all those things are happening to all of us. Um, and then I think for some people, people care people enter into this through much more pragmatic or seemingly more pragmatic things like economics. Um, like the reality is that it is more important to us to lock up communities of color in America than just about anything else. The one other thing that's more important to us is having a lot of bombs. Like if we look at how we spend our money, number one is like we want to have just like a lot of bombs, like in different kinds and in different places, just like ready to go little bombs, big bombs, like that's number one. And then number two is locking up people and especially people of color. That is our second shared priority, right? And that everything else that we want and don't get, we don't get because of the ways we've prioritized those things.